Good morning, 216ers. This is Professor Kaufman, and what follows is a quick overview of your final project for the fall semester. It involves optimizing an existing routine that works on matrices, and to do so, you'll need to first figure out what the memory utilization bottlenecks are and sort those out, and then as well, uh, add some multi-threading supports. And this is a fairly common tactic as uh, you'd exhaust the options for single-threaded performance uh, to add and throw more cores at the problem to get better performance. Uh, it's just a single problem, and it relates very strongly to things that we've now completed in lecture and are the subject of study uh, for your discussions this week. And so take and use techniques and code that's provided in those settings uh, liberally here. Uh, just a quick overview of the problem. It is to sum the diagonals of the matrix. And in case it's been a while or you've not seen uh, matrices before, they are, again, just fancy 2D arrangements of numbers and into rows and columns. It being a programming language endeavor and us being in a sort of standard programming environment, uh, unlike math, we'll number these as rows 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, rather than starting at row 1 and similarly columns 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So here's a typical square matrix. It's the kind that you'll deal with in the problem. So sum up the diagonals of a square matrix. And a diagonal uh, is just what the name implies. Uh, it's going from upper left to lower right, some diagonal. And the coloring of this example is given so that each element that's in a particular diagonal is colored similarly to the other elements that are in the same diagonal. So oftentimes there's uh, the notion of a main diagonal that starts in the very upper left and goes to the very lower right. You can see this is uh, colored in goldenrod over here. There are upper diagonals, uh, the ones that are above that main diagonal. So this 1, 7, 13, 19, that's one above uh, the gray, 2, 8, 14, et cetera, two above, et cetera. And there are also lower diagonals uh, colored in cyan, green, and uh, salmon uh, down here. Uh, there's not a, exactly a standard scheme for numbering diagonals, uh, but we'll adopt the following because it'll be convenient for what we're trying to compute on it. Uh, that diagonal zero is the one that's way down here and comprises just a single element, uh, this pink 20 here. And then as you would scan to the right and up, the diagonal number increases there. So 15 and 21 are diagonal one, uh, 10, 16, 22 are diagonal two, etc. And the task here is just to go through and compute an array, or vector, if you will, uh, of this d0, d1, d2, d3, d4, which is the sum of all the elements in the corresponding diagonal. So for instance, this lower right, or lower left one, uh, 20, diagonal zero, it's very simple, it's 20. Uh, 15 and 21, they comprise uh, diagonal one, and their sum is 36. 10, 16, 22, sums to 48. That's what would be in this uh, element index two of that uh, array of sums and so forth. However, here, uh, the largest diagonal, the main diagonal, has a sum of 60 if you were to go through it, uh, and so on down the line uh, here. Uh, the example given here is meant to be easy to read, so it's numbered sequentially, but it will actually generate random elements, uh, random numbers in the matrices you have to sum. So uh, in the past, uh, folks have tried to figure out some you know, deterministic scheme to say, like, oh, if I had a matrix that's uh, numbered like this, I could figure out an order one time like what each of these are, and that's not the point of the exercise. Instead, it's to figure out what the sums are in a relatively efficient way. Now what's provided to you uh, is given here in code below, and it's part of the code pack, um, is uh, something called some diag base normal. Uh, it's sort of the baseline version of it that takes the sort of human summing uh, algorithm that you'd use. Um, and we'll go through the code just ever so briefly here, but it's to literally like, oh, if I'm trying to compute to this fourth diagonal, I'm gonna add zero and then you find this element at six and then at 12 and then at 18 and 24. And so I've completely computed diagonal element four here as 60. Um, this means that you figure out where diagonal starts and then each iteration uh, through this loop, so you've got a loop over diagonals and then a loop over rows columns here uh, to sort of visit each of the elements of that diagonal. Um, each element, like you're incrementing both the row and the column to sort of go down, right, down, right, down, right, or down, right, down, right, down, right. Um, this one's just mildly complex because uh, the a way that you find a starting element in the lower diagonals versus the upper diagonals is just slightly different, um, so uh, no matter there. Now, what should immediately strike you about this is, sure, it's easy to visually compute, but if you were asked to have a computer code do this, um, you'd notice that, oh, if I go from element zero and then to element six and then to element 12, 
this actually skips a whole bunch of elements row-wise. And C being a row major language, uh, this is not going to be favorable to cache performance. And so while it gets the job done, this routine is relatively slow compared to what it could be. Your job is to optimize this in two ways. Uh, the first is to figure out how do I rearrange this code so as to better utilize cache. And the sort of running theme of that kind of optimization is try to induce as little stride as possible. If you can figure out a way, and there is a way, uh, to just scan across rows here uh, to do things, uh, then you'll be in good shape in terms of utilizing cache efficiently. Uh, the next optimization to perform on this is to figure out how to multi-thread it. Uh, so launch one or two or four or possibly more threads uh, that subdivide the work here uh, that is to be done uh, and contribute overall so that if I do this with not one but two threads, I should get about twice the performance or take about half the wall clock time uh, to sum these up. Uh, so those are the two required optimizations uh, that are described, and there's some notes uh, as you move down. Um, the evaluation of this is in part based on performance. And so a benchmark is provided for this that as you'd run it, it would look something like this, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, and uh, the benchmark will uh, run your code, your optimized version of this, on a number of matrices with a number of different threads and compare the time that it takes there to the baseline provided implementation and give you some notion of, oh, this is what my speed up is. Uh, as in, uh, the baseline version took 0.041 seconds. Uh, my optimized version for the size matrix took 0.019 seconds. Uh, and that's about twice as fast. Uh, speed up is just computed as whatever the base version was uh, divided by the time that you took for the optimized version. Uh, if there's no speed up, then the speed up would be 1.0. And then uses a little formula to calculate a number of points uh, that are based on this. Generally, uh, if you get better speed ups, you get more points, and there are more points and a greater weighting uh, associated with larger matrices as you go down here. Uh, this is where uh, your cache utilization will be more effective. It's like uh, if you're visiting things in the wrong order for small size matrices and they fit all in cache, it doesn't really matter. It matters much more when you get to larger, chunky matrices that don't fit all in cache, so your decisions have more impact. Uh, so you can see uh, this run here got, you know, a reasonable amount of points, uh, 28 points, but uh, there's a number of warnings here because the benchmark is tuned specifically to the architecture on the Grace cluster. Uh, and that means that running it on my home computer uh, here, uh, I can't necessarily trust the number of points I'm getting uh, on this. And those warnings will be you know, issued sort of uh, and, and expected in this case. Uh, on the other hand, if I actually logged into Grace at an SSH uh, and then ran it, you'd see the absence of warnings here. But for the same run, I get slightly different points here. And that's because Grace had a different sort of memory architecture and CPU performance uh, as compared to the my version. Um, if you make some more changes then and rerun for a final time, uh, what you'll probably see, uh, you know, if you're implementing the two required optimizations is some number of points that's modestly greater than 35 with some consistency. Now, always there are caveats associated with these benchmarks, and I want to name those uh, so that you're aware of them. First, it's a performance benchmark, and that is generally hard to do. And what you might notice is that your results are a little bit inconsistent. Sometimes you get 35 points, sometimes you get 37 points, and it sort of bounces around a little bit. Uh, that's natural and expected because it's dictated somewhat on the environment that's being run. Uh, we've got two strikes against us on the environment. Uh, Grace is a shared system, and so you may want to log in and run a command like top, which I can demonstrate in just a second, uh, so that you know like what the system load is, and we can sort of work around that a little bit as well. Um, if there are a lot of people running on the same Grace instance, uh, Grace 10 here, by for instance, if it's heavily loaded, then chances are likely that your performance will be a little bit lower than it might read uh, if it were an unloaded system, and I can show you some tactics to work around that. Second, Grace is actually a virtualized environment, uh, which means it's not real hardware. You're under the auspices of a virtual machine um, supervisor. And that means that you can't necessarily rely upon the performance being always the same. So you may be even on an unloaded machine and run it and get slightly different performance from one next uh, run to the next. Pay that no mind. Uh, when TAs go to evaluate this, 
they will download your code, run it on an unloaded Grace node, and run it three times and take the best score. And that's generally in the past for the years that I've used assignments like this has proven like very effective in terms of like if you got full credit in some of your runs, like that'll well, come through in the grading part. It is important to realize that since um, the grade scope submission server is different than Grace, we won't be running uh, these performance benchmark there and you won't see this score when you submit your code. Instead, that's gonna come later during grading, then you'll see that in the grading criteria. So all that said then, uh, with this optimized version, uh, it's entirely in a, let's see, um, I have it somewhere here, but like, there's a SumDiag Optim code, and basically it's the same prototype for this thing up here, SumDiag based normal. Uh, you write a SumDiag Optim uh, version of this. The only thing it takes in addition uh, is a, uh, a number of threads to use. Uh, and so we can take a look at that and, and sort of see what, what, what happens up there. Uh, other things to be aware of, not much. I mean, this one's uh, pretty straightforward. Oh yeah, uh, there's some diagnostic tools. So always when you're optimizing, um, there's the risk that you try something fancy to make the code run faster and find that it breaks, uh, that yeah, it's going faster, but it's now computing incorrect results. Very typical uh, of sort of like that. And to keep you honest, there's some automated tests that check for correctness for this as well as a SumDiag print uh, function, uh, the main routine that allows you to take and run your optimized version on a sized matrix that you want with a number of threads that you want. And it will evaluate the um, baseline version and the optimized version and then produce fairly verbose output about whether or not you're matching up. Um, so for instance, uh, here, uh, this five by five matrix, uh, the sums are computed and the optimized version that I provided running under a single thread here, uh, this produced incorrect results uh, for part of this that some of the diagonal sums are, are not right. And so I want to go and correct that. Uh, this kind of tool can be useful for diagnosing problems. You may have to run on slightly bigger matrices to get insight to it. It certainly doesn't say this is what's wrong with your code, but it's what will be used in the test cases. And so it's good to be aware that, oh, you can use this yourself on, on that stuff. Um, so the two main optimizations, again, reorder the memory access uh, and as well um, use multiple threads. There are a couple constraints on threads to get you to learn how to do this more generally. Um, it's possible to code the solution without use of any locking or mutexes, but this is a required element of your implementation uh, to demonstrate you know how to use a mutex. It's not hard uh, in this limited setting, so uh, be aware of that part. As well then, uh, avoid using global variables. Uh, this is generally an easy way to get a first pass at multi-threaded stuff, but it doesn't generalize very well. Uh, and that's if you have a nicely written matrix diagonal sum routine that's multi-threaded, but it uses global variables, then only one thread can call that sort of multi-threaded thing at a time that um, you've sort of crippled its ability to be used in multiple instances there. So instead, uh, make use of the tactics that have been described in lecture, as well as in discussions to pass to your worker functions some sort of a context struct that contains information like which thread, how many threads are there, and references to any matrix and vector data structures uh, that are in there. I should mention uh, as well that the baseline code provides a few uh, items here that, oh, there's some mget and vget uh, uh, stuff in here uh, that are macros that will dispatch to the get elements. You're not required to use any of these, but for reasoning as your first pass, it's an easy way to sort of get your, a grip on, on some of this stuff. Um, so to that end, you know, uh, be aware. Okay, so let's just uh, do a little bit of setup here on this. Uh, I'm gonna need to log into Grace as well as do a few other things. Uh, let me get this thing out of the way and get a Grace instance up here. I have to log in, uh, blah, 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 password. Always forgetting. Ah, I screwed it up so much. Press backspace a arbitrarily large number of times and hopefully good, do my little do authentication, then we'll get to find out whether I actually got my um, password right here. Do, 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 do. Approved, and I'm in, cool. Okay, uh, since I, Emacs is my jam, I'm gonna fire it up in here, um, but it's not, I mean, you can do what you want uh, on Grace there, I can get a shell. Uh, I'm gonna need to grab the code, so over here, can grab this thing, I'll copy the link address, 
Um, let's see, where do I want to put this? Uh, I guess I'll go into CMS. Do I have a C? Yeah, I have a CMS C266. I have a few things in here. Uh, and I'll do a wget on that link so I can download the code. Uh, that's there, and I'll unzip the P5 code. Uh, and if I look around in here now, here's my P5 code and got all the stuff. Uh, so as a quick tour, uh, here is the baseline version. Uh, it's divided into two parts. There's this sum diag base normal uh, part up here, and it has the main body of the code down here. But then there's also a debugging version that, that I found useful, but you probably won't have any need uh, to make use of. Uh, and then finally, a sort of entry point, some diag base that calls just the, the normal one here. Um, now that setup is a little bit much for this baseline version, but it models what you are provided in the optimized version. Uh, I'll buzz over there quick. So this is incomplete code. Typically, students develop several versions of the optimized version and sort of compare performance of them and select which one is best. And this template is set up specifically to encourage that. Uh, so down here is the function that's going to be called by the benchmarks. I can call that, that thing down over here. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, prototypes for several different versions. So I might try in here, like, let me just try something to optimize the memory version. Uh, and then down here, I'll add to the memory thing that I did, the threaded version. Uh, down, down here, I'm gonna try more exotic techniques, maybe that I read about in chapter five of Brian O'Hanran, to unroll some loops or cut out some macro calls or something like that, and see if that gets, and, and if I find like, oh, this latest version didn't actually do any better than the first one, then it's just, you know, revert back to version one uh, or change to version two here. Um, so allows you to retain those in a you know, semi-sane fashion to experiment a little bit there. Uh, let's, you know, do the first thing like uh, that comes to mind here, which is, you know, copy paste. Uh, I don't even need really to copy paste. Um, well, okay, let's, let's just make sure we, we compile because I'm pretty sure this compiles out of the gate. So if I call a make, uh, let's see, I got to change into P5 code though. Make and here is, so builds out of the gate. No, don't even need to change anything. Uh, and then as I run the sumdiag uh, benchmark uh, here, uh, then I'll be greeted with a litany of errors because the benchmark checks, hey, uh, your baseline version, um, does the optimized version you provided, does it actually produce the same results as the baseline version? If not, then you, know, you get zero points uh, because incorrect results are easy to generate fast as we've demonstrated here, just you know, return nothing. <laughs> Um, so let's uh, rectify that by, for instance, cheating a little bit. And it's not cheating, it's sort of just you know, getting in working order. Uh, I've got this baseline version over here. And so one of the things I could opt to do is just, well, let me call this uh, version uh, baseline normal. I'll pass the mat, I'll pass it the vec. Uh, I'm not going to use the thread count in this because this one's single threaded. Uh, and so basically I'm just leveraging the baseline version here to get the correct results by calling the baseline version a second time. Now the general expectation is that I won't have any, oh, I got to declare it. Uh, I'll just go ahead and do it the baseline version without the normal on it. That'll be good enough. Um, I, my general expectation is that this is going to run exactly the same speed as the normal one. And so I should get almost no points here. And you can see it might be getting a little bit lucky or a little bit unlucky here because the timing is like, oh, it's about the same in a lot of cases. The other ones sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter depending on the cache performance. But as we get to larger stuff, it's almost exactly the same. So this is gonna be a pittance in terms of uh, points. Uh, the next steps uh, to do in terms of trying to get an optimized version would be to start filling in some actual code here uh, that does things differently than this some diag version. So, might you know copy the code in for this uh like maybe i'd take this little uh, checking thing down here and just uh you know move the error checking there uh and then do some stuff about like okay i'll copy this code in and paste this here and now i can start trying to optimize uh, some stuff and i don't have any great ideas right now but i might try like coalescing like putting these two loops together something like that um so got some new code uh come down here see i got oh, not even a quite one point uh, here uh, but if i make and run again 
I'm still running the same baseline version, so I don't expect any speed up, and, and yeah, I'm not getting any. But this is where then you'd uh, assert some creativity and, and try to figure bump some of that stuff out. Uh, now, a couple of things to note. I'm going to kill this uh, control C it uh, to do it. Um, I, it's not a bad idea to check the system load here. So right now you can see I'm on grace eight over here. Uh, and if I top this and check, uh, this is a command that when you run it, it takes over the screen and shows you interactively what's going on on this node. Um, there's a few other people running programs over here, like uh, Kamala, uh, probably not our vice president, but uh, possibly. Uh, but you can see the CPU utilization is pretty low right now. There's not a lot going on here. And that's a good sign that um, I am not probably going to have much trouble getting authentic results on this um, uh, machine. But if I saw over here uh, two or three programs running at 90%, 100% CPU utilization, that means there's some load on the machine. And the results that I get as I had run uh, my code might not necessarily, I mean, I'll, they'll probably be lower than I'd expect in an unloaded node because I'm competing with these other users um, for the, uh, the sort of usage of the CPU. And that means my code slows down a little bit. Uh, if you find that you're on, as you've logged in, on a loaded node for that, you can SSH over to a different one. Uh, one moment, please. Uh, uh, for instance, let me try to SSH to Grace2 here. Uh, let's see. Sometimes this works. Uh, there's no Grace2. Let's see. So we'll try Grace10 instead. Yeah, there we go. We're good. One moment. Uh, and uh, let's see. So I go there. I'll authorize here. It'll be good. Let's see, and then if I top on here, yeah, you can see this one's just a little bit more loaded with a, a couple things happening. So uh, to that end, uh, just look around. As you'd run top and see, oh, things are kind of happening on here, like so some Emacs and Factor happening, uh, then you can change around and look for a relatively unloaded node. To get out of top, you can press Q uh, to quit. And the file system is shared, so any files you have on any Grace nodes, uh, you're in good shape there. Uh, I think that's about all that I need uh, to say about this one. Um, it's relatively straightforward, and I know folks have already been getting pretty good performance results. I should mention that should you get sufficient performance above and beyond the 35 points, there may be some makeup credits uh, buried in there at varying levels. Uh, and to that end, if you achieve that, it'll be very obvious to you um, that uh, you've gotten it based on the output of the benchmark. All right, that's what I've got for you. Make sure to, oh, what, one last thing. Um, in addition to the code itself and the performance benchmark, there are a number of questions you'll have to answer about it in a little write-up document. That's included, and uh, there's a significant amount of credit associated with that write-up. Um, so have a look at this and answer some questions here. Some are really easy, like paste your source code and your timing table by in. Uh, but then as well, there's some uh, discussion of how did you optimize the memory? What steps did you take? Why were they effective? Uh, how did you utilize threads? What step did you take? How did you subdivide work, et cetera? So to that end, uh, make sure not to forget that part, as there would be a significant amount of credit lost if you completely omitted that. All right, that's all I got for you. Got to give some makeup exams at this point. Uh, so happy hacking to all, and I'll see you at our last lecture.